The College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences at The Ohio State University has found success with a new pilot for enrollment called the Buckeye Agricultural Leadership Pathways Program, or BOUP. Joining us is the Dean of the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences, Kath Ann Kress. Great to see you. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Ty. Thanks for having me in. I always love getting a chance to talk with you and talking about our Buckeyes. So what was the aim of this new pilot project? Well, Ty, it was pretty simple. You know, as I went around the state, as I uh, looked around the college, it was really clear to me that sometimes uh, our students here in the state of Ohio were having a little trouble uh, finding their way to us in the college. Uh, and there were a whole lot of reasons for that. Uh, I think everybody knows that, you know, uh, Ohio State uh, really wanting to kind of up our game, uh, it can be a little harder to get in. And unfortunately, it seemed like sometimes that was hitting some of our audiences a little harder than others. So for example, if they looked at AP courses and how many AP courses you took, well, we know that some of our rural school districts only have one AP course that even the brightest student could take. So it was already starting to impact them in ways that, that didn't seem quite right. I was also really concerned because I know the capacity of our college and I know that these students could be successful and I know our industry needs them in the workforce and needs them right here in the state of Ohio. So we were pretty clear something needed to be done. I also heard loud and clear from so many in our industry, something really needed to be done. So we, we, we gave it a try. Of course, being a pilot project, you start in a relatively small space and see if it works and then build out from there. What part of the college was this pilot used on? Uh, this pilot uh, impacted all of our departments and programs, except for animal sciences and the School of Environment and Natural Resources. They were left out because when the university did its initial review, their enrollments were already up. And so it was kind of hard to convince the university to let us include them in the pilot when their enrollments were already up. Now, I'm convincing them of that for the second year, uh, and I can talk to you a little bit about what areas I'm concerned about there. Uh, but really, they let us then include every other part of the college. What were some of the strategies used to target first-year applicants? Well, I'm really excited to say that uh, we were very successful in convincing the university that since 4-H is our program in the college, that, gee, maybe they should consider 4-H experience and 4-H enrollment particularly when you understand that most of the 4-H curriculum is written by our faculty. Uh, even the 4-H curriculum that's used nationwide, I'm really proud to say, comes from Ohio State University. Uh, and so to me, that was kind of a no-brainer uh, that if you have these young people, and we know many of them, spend like 10 years in the 4-H program, that that should count. Uh, and so I was delighted uh, that we now uh, can count 4-H experience and particularly those who've had that experience with those senior levels of 4-H where we know how rigorous uh, some of that content is. Uh, FFA experience, uh, both in the classroom as well as the overall FFA leadership and everything else, that should count for something. We know it makes a huge difference uh, in their uh, later success in the industry. Uh, and so we were able to get that uh, considered as part of that as well. Uh, the other thing, though, that was huge for us was in the past, what would happen is we would get a tremendous number of applicants. You know, uh, every year when we didn't quite get the enrollment numbers we wanted, I'd go and look at the application list and it, the numbers were staggering. And it was like, OK, wait a minute, what's going on here? Well, what we discovered was we were getting all these applicants, but then they were getting waitlisted. So they had to sit around and wait for their final admittance. While they were waitlisted, it's like they were kind of hanging out there. I couldn't talk to them about scholarships. I couldn't let them know all the cool things that we could do for them in the college. We had to just sit and wait too, which created a perfect opportunity for other land grants to step in and say, hey, we'd love to have you come here. We can offer you these scholarships. And I don't blame a lot of those young people that then they were like, well, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush and I'm gonna take advantage of this and go. Um, we were able to document that over time, even though people dropped off that wait list, that everybody who was on the wait list eventually was admitted. So 
we were we had created this loss situation for us in the college. So one of the big wins of the pilot was getting rid of that wait list, which allows us to then immediately reach out to those young people, offer them the scholarships, which we award more scholarships than any other part of Ohio State University, I'm proud to say, thanks to our great donors and alums, uh, well over $3 million worth of scholarships every year for Ohio students. And so we wanted to be able to, as quickly as possible, get those packages into their hands and help them understand what that could look like. So those were some of the really big pieces of this enrollment pilot. So what did enrollment numbers look like with this pilot project compared to the years past? Well, what the university told me is if we saw a 5% increase in enrollment, they'd let us keep moving forward with this pilot. And I'm really pleased to say that we saw a 30% increase wow. in enrollment. So I think we're on the right track. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Uh, as the numbers are, you know, of course, still shaken out because it's, you know, just yesterday was the first day of classes. But it's still looking like we've held really strong uh, with those. And, and we do expect that in those programs that were part of the pilot, we're looking at a 30% increase. Uh, ATI, our two-year technical school, which was also part of this, uh, they they saw a 10% increase in enrollment, which we, we couldn't be more excited about that. Uh, so across the board, uh, in all of our programs, we saw double digit uh, increases in enrollment. Uh, so yeah, you can bet I was immediately back at the university knocking on the door going, ooh, ooh, <laughs> I want to do more. I want to do more. Um, when you couple that together with the student success metrics our college has, uh, you know, it is it is no joke. This this college does incredible work around student success. We have the best retention rates. Uh, our retention rates for our students is at about 95 percent, which if you look nationally, typically the average retention rate is around 70 or 75 percent. So that really tells you something about our faculty and our staff and their ability to build that community around our students and how important that is to us. Uh, even better. When our students graduate and I hand them that diploma in the shoe, we know that over 95% of them already have a job or in graduate school or professional school uh, and, and uh, within six months. And that's a great outcome. And even better, we've been tracking this too, Ty. Uh, when I first got here, I was concerned about keeping our talent in the state of Ohio. Uh, when I got here, about 75% of our students stayed in Ohio. We've really tried to focus on pathways programs, not just pathways into the college, but pathways after they graduate. And that number is now up to 80%. 80% of our graduates are staying right here in the state of Ohio and working in our fields. It's your job to look at the future. Every single day you look ahead. So as you look at this project uh, in year one and, and look at it moving forward, you mentioned adding a couple of schools uh, into this pilot project. What are some other things that you see uh, as this moves forward, changing and, and uh, evolving as it goes? Well, we just have to make it easier for young people, right? Um, you know, one is we have to keep getting the message out. A lot of young people still have the impression it's very, very difficult to get in. And, and it is you, you have to be a good student. Uh, but there's still lots of opportunities and pathways to get to us, and we want you and we need you. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think part of it is is how we even do our recruitment and our admissions. We've got to get a bit savvier. Uh, we've done a lot more with pathways programs, reaching out even to fifth graders and sixth graders, because, you know, it, it's it shouldn't be a big surprise to any of us. You know, young people today don't exactly wake up and say, hey, I think I want to go into food, agriculture, and the environment for a career. Uh, they they just don't always recognize the opportunities. A lot of them think that if I don't have, you know, a herd of cows or a lot of land, it's not for me. When the truth is we have hundreds and hundreds of occupations in our industry, as you know, uh, most of them are high tech. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, USDA did a, a study and found out that all colleges like ours across the United States are only producing about 33,000 graduates to take those positions. And there's about 60,000 of those positions that exist. So we just have to keep being very aggressive about helping young people to understand 
that this is a great career pathway, uh, that it's a high tech industry uh, and you can do almost anything, whether you're interested in international trade, whether you're interested in production farming, whether you're interested in water quality, whether you're interested in genetics or nutrition. Uh, it, there's such a variety of things that you can do in uh, agriculture and the food system. And we want to make sure more young people understand that. The Buckeye Agricultural Leadership Pathways Program, allowing more youth an opportunity to go to the best land grant in the country. Dean Kathan Kress, Vice President for Agricultural Administration and Dean of the College of Food, Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, our guest on the Ohio Farm Bureau podcast. Thank you so much. Great information. and appreciate your time. Thank you, Ty, and go Bucks. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Ty. And you My take pleasure. care of yourself. Yep, you too. Thanks, Dean. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Bye. Here in our state, there's an energy at work, a drive to help people live healthier lives with confidence, but it can't be done alone. That's why our healthcare, business, and community leaders have joined together to help people here feel more empowered by their health care, leading to improved long-term health and savings. A health plan for small businesses in the agricultural industry was created by the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation. It provides members the tools, resources, and financial protection to feel confident in their health care decisions. By sharing responsibilities, we help build healthier employees and communities, driving down costs, connecting members digitally to Anthem's diverse network of local resources, participating in health literacy, easing administrative burdens. Joining the plan means you're part of making healthcare work better, giving people the confidence to make anything possible. To learn more about how the plan can work for your business, visit our website or call your broker or Anthem sales representative. Find out how nationwide agribusiness can help you grow your business. Get to know the people with the experience and knowledge to help you. Whether you are looking to protect your farm or ranch from the ground up, or need someone who understands your changing commercial ag needs. Find out how to better manage the risks of your ag business, or how quickly you can get back to business. Learn how you can protect your next with Nationwide on your side. Welcome back to the Ohio Farm Bureau podcast, talking about labor this week. I'm Ty Higgins. Labor is a huge component of many farms and businesses in the ag supply chain today. In many communities, it may be challenging to attract and retain talented employees. Offering a retirement savings option may be just the solution to help your operation stand out. To find out what's best for you and your employees, we bring in George Shine, a financial specialist from Nationwide's Land as Your Legacy program, to talk about the benefits offered by several savings options. George, great to see you. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's happy to be here. You do a great job on the Ag Insight Center in a piece about this, of breaking it down into really four categories, four options to recruit and retain top farm employees. I want to just run down those one by one and kind of tell you, uh, have you tell us about them and how they might work for, for farmers and agribusinesses throughout Ohio. The first one being the Simplified Employee Pension or SEP plan. How does that work? So the, the SEP plan, as they're known, SEPs, as you said, simplified employee plan, they're really meant for the small, I, I would say the small employer, the, I shouldn't say small operation because you can have a very large operation with only a few employees nowadays. But when you think of retirement plans and the, the paper you reference, and I think the discussion today, we're sort of gonna sort of build in complexity. And that build in complexity is usually also going to be tied to the number of employees. But let's say you're, you've got a small handful of employees and you want to set up a retirement plan to help, you know, keep them, keep them local, keep them work, serving your agribusiness, your, your farm, what, what have you. So this is essentially an IRA that you are setting up. And when I say you, I'm including the owner. So the owner of the enterprise may also participate. And so it's, a, it's an IRA, it's set up, there's an IRS form that you can fill out. To, to, to start it. So it doesn't require like a private attorney to create a document or anything like that. It's pretty standard. And you are able to contribute 
up to 61, well, that's the, actually that's outdated. I think it's $65,000 this year. Um, it, the, the maximum changes every year. The IRS issues uh, increases based on cost of living adjustments and inflation, but this year it's $65,000. In another month, the IRS will issue higher numbers for next year, most likely. But the point is you can, you can stick around over $60,000 into an IRA for yourself, if you're the owner, or for your employees. All of this money is considered uh, employer money, employer contribution. And so none of it is none of it is the employee's own deferrals. All of this is employer money. And that's one important distinction that separates this SEP from all the other types of retirement plans that, that I reference in the paper and that we'll talk about here a little later. Yeah, next up, the simple IRA plan. How does that one work? So think of the simple IRA as that next stepping stone or building block. It's not a full 401k, um, but this plan does permit both the employer. In fact, it requires the employer, the owner, to make a contribution. It could either be a matching contribution or a non-elective, meaning a profit sharing contribution. So in other words, the um, owner is going to have to contribute at least 2% of that employee's compensation into the plan a year. And then all of those employees are also able to contribute. Uh, this year, that limit is, I think, $15,500 per year of employee money. That's the employee's own deferrals. That, that number, like I said, will increase uh, next year, most likely. The other interesting thing to note about these simples is that they're not, I said it was a stepping stone between a SEP and, an, and a full-fledged 401k. Simples are still IRA-based plans, they're, so it's not a full plan. Um, once again, these are relatively easy to set up. They don't require a full plan document, um, and they're... Uh, there's also an interesting change that came about by some legislation that was passed at the end of last year known as Secure Act 2.0 that um, the, these are good plans that if you're a growing business, um, it used to be that you had to run these plans through the end of the year. And then if you wanted to grow, you could start up a full 401k plan. Now you can actually sort of cease these mid-year and replace them with a 401k. So they're particularly good, a good option for a growing business. Now we get a little more complex as we work up this scale to the 401k defined contribution plans. Right. Now, these would be sort of the most complex that you're going to deal with in terms of a defined contribution plan. 401k plans, that 401k, that's a reference in, to the Internal Revenue Code, uh, Section 401k, and it, it allows for employees to contribute this year, up to $22,500 per year. That's employee money. That's the employee's own compensation they choose to contribute. If they're age 50 or older, they can make catch-up contributions. And this year, that limits $7,500. So before you even get into any type of employer match or employer profit share, the employee hypothetically has the ability to sock away up to $30,000 a year if they're at least age 50. Um, and the 22.5 if, if they're not yet hit, hitting 50. Um, and then obviously with 401ks, the employer can also make that contribution, uh, a matching or a profit share, so that by the end of the year, once again, that same SEP limit of 61,000 last year at 65,000 or so, give or take this year, you can actually have the ability to save up to $65,000 a year uh, into into your retirement plan. Now, 401k plans, interestingly enough, now we're sort of, I alluded to the fact that generally, in general terms, the more employees, the more likely you are to open a full, a full 401k. But depending on facts and circumstances, so as an attorney, I, I am a lawyer, I always have to, you know, you have to <laughs> sort of hedge your bets and, you know, everything's dependent on facts and circumstances, right? But there is such thing as a solo 401k. So, I mean, if you have enough disposable income and you, you know, you're a farmer, you have an agribusiness, even if you don't have 50 employees or 20 employees, if you have the financial capacity and want to sock away, you know, 22 
thousand dollars, you can still have a 401k, even if it's just for yourself or just you and a handful of employees. It's just that, generally speaking, there there are more costs involved with starting the 401k, and so if you're really only able to contribute five six thousand dollars to towards your retirement, it would make more sense for you to start small with the SEP because that's the smaller limit to begin with and there's less administrative costs and, and um, fees of that sort. The fourth and final being defined benefits plans. Tell us about those. So defined benefit plans, you're hearing about them a lot in the news because the striking auto workers are wanting to reinstate these defined benefit plans, which uh, my personal opinion is that that's a pipe dream. You know, defined benefit plans sort of have gone the way of the dodo bird, but they do exist still, and uh, they are still being started. The vast majority of defined benefit plans today are technically, a, they're defined benefit plans, but they're referred to as a hybrid between a defined benefit and a defined contribution plan. And the the term is cash balance plan. And so there's a formula that's established by the employer. So, you know, so much money, and it's usually a percentage of comp, will go into this plan every year. And then once retirement comes, that that retiring employee, that retiring participant, they can take a lump sum cash distribution just like they could with a 401k plan, but they also have the option to convert that set quantity, that cash balance account into an annuitized stream of payment that would be calculated based on some actuarial numbers and factors um, that are written into other parts of the code, as well as the interest rates at the time that that retirement happens. And so these cash balance plans, you do still see, I can't say I see a lot of them in, in the agricultural space, but you do still see them and they are still common. Those would be sort of like the final, the final step, right? If you're able to maximize your 401k plan and you're contributing the maximum legal level and you still have money that you want to set aside for retirement, that's when you start looking at, at the DB plan and within that db plan space i'm usually nine times out of ten you're going to be thinking cash balance formula of course the size of your workforce a major factor determining which plan is best of these four that we talked about but you recommend talking to a financial professional to learn more about your options yes definitely these are you know i graduated law school in 2007 and i've always been an employee benefits attorney and i you know i live in this world but these are complex creations of law, right, of federal law. And there are a number of different sort of I's to dot and T's to cross when you're setting these plans up. I'm, I'm calling them plans, but if I was being more technical, I would want to differentiate once again, because a SEP and the simple are technically IRAs. And when I say IRA, I mean um, individual retirement account. And so, that's why when you're establishing these retirement plans, both for your own benefit, and when I say your own, I mean the benefit of the owner, but also for the benefit of the employees, you want to be working with a um, competent uh, financial advisor that will be able to get that plan established in accordance with applicable laws and rules as set out by not only the IRS, but also the Department of Labor. George Schein, a financial specialist from Nationwide's Land as your legacy program, joining us. You can visit aginsightcenter.com for resources and expert tips on trending topics like this one. Help you run a successful business and maintain the safety of your operation. George, appreciate your time and thank you for the insights. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me.